being here. Very much appreciate it. Here's to uh, Sine dying. Uh, but real quick in the afternoons after Governor Otter finished his plea to the legislature for moderate policies, we immediately started working on addressing issues that affect the majority of Idahoans. We made clear that our goals as a minority caucus was to measure our votes based on three simple questions. Will it improve our education system? Will it improve our economy? And will it maintain our quality of life? I'm proud to say that the minority upheld our end of the bargain and we held the majority accountable at the same time. It's clear to me that our constituents, that we represent the moderate middle, and we're proud to be there. While the majority wasted time fighting each other like children on a playground, they also brought legislation that was not beneficial to Idahoans. Idaho Democrats work together for everyone, and we will continue to do what is best for Idahoans from Bonners Ferry to the Owyhees to Bear Lake. Once again, the majority kicked the can down the road, and this time they only have themselves to blame. Roughly 78,000 Idahoans, 12% of which are veterans, live without health care or health insurance. Idaho Democrats, on three separate occasions, tried to pass legislation expanding Medicaid to cover the gap. There's no time to wait. If we're willing to accept $300 million in loans from the federal government to address transportation in Idaho, we shouldn't think twice about something that would actually make an investment, saving lives, and saving Idaho millions of dollars. As the leaders of Idaho's middle ground, we've always made education a top priority, and this session was no different. We made improvements that will benefit Idaho's students and teachers. Our relentless approach to supporting education has turned the majority into followers on this issue, and we are proud to lead. From the middle, we worked across the aisle to bring civil asset forfeiture, something that Representative Alana Rubel led the charge on because we know that protecting due process rights is something that Idahoans hold dear. At the same time, Representative Melissa Wintrow led the charge to ensure victims receive the protections they deserve and that law enforcement treats them with the utmost respect. And rather than chasing shadows or irrational fears, we recognize the real threats to our state. Democratic minority worked tirelessly for policies that protected our waterways and prevented the introduction of invasive species in Idaho. Our leadership led to the passage of multiple bills that will make a substantial difference protecting our environment. And finally, yesterday, we secured substantial funding for safe routes to school, which will help modernize sidewalks and pedestrian crossings from Caldwell to Potlatch and many places in between something we've been advocating for since 2014. I could go on and on about the Republicans, uh, about the bills the Republicans carried that harmed our education system, damaged our economy, or threatened our quality of life. Bills like the one exempting communications between legislators and special interests from public, school, public records requests, or the odd Sharia law bill, or the anti-migrant worker bill. But here's the thing. Our unrelenting pressure and renewed public involvement stopped these bills. As leaders of the moderate middle, we steered the conversation to more reasonable ideas, like Representative High Clock's resolution recognizing the important contributions of immigrants on our nation. We also played an essential role in deciding many important votes on the floor and in committee. Without the power of Idaho Democrats, children who've been plagued by emotional disturbances would not be eligible for medical assistance in House Bill 43. <clears throat> and lastly, Idaho House Democrats were the key committee votes that ensured citizens the most important oil and gas reforms the state has ever seen. Our votes were necessary to protect our groundwater, our private property rights, and to open the industry to transparency. Idaho still has over five... Oops. <laughs> With that... I'd like to pass. Uh, I'd like to pass the microphone over to my colleague, Senator Michelle Stennett. Thank welcome. Thank you very much. We just adjourned, so thank you for your patience and welcome. I'm honored to be one of the two legislators appointed as the Governor Otter's Workforce Development Task Force. The task force is charged with studying ways to improve Idaho's funding and delivery of training programs to meet growing employer demand for skilled workers. 
New job growth is projected to be at 138,000, but the looming mass retirement by the baby boomer generation means that we're looking for a workforce shortage of about 49,000 workers with necessary skills to fill those jobs. I'm pleased to be part of the ongoing effort to expand opportunities with Idaho's workforce. The steps that are being take, taken are vital to Idaho's future. However, it is important to note that Idaho is still behind in education standards. To improve opportunities for our workforce, we first need to improve opportunities for our students. We've done this by increasing discretionary funding for school districts, funding the third year of the career ladder, continuing funding for and implementing of the 20 recommendations from the Education Task Force, and continue to advocate for our educators. It is distressing, however, to see the progress sidelined by damaging K-12 science standards that remove climate change science from our children's curriculum. Education took another hit with the passage of Senate Bill 1206, the so-called getting out of here transportation bill, which ultimately takes 15 million unbudgeted dollars ongoing from the general fund and challenges our ability to fully fund the five-year teacher pay career ladder. This bill is pushed through the last minute with no public testimony, not very much um, vetting through the, the transportation process, and is calling for $300 million of Garvey bonding, primarily designed for the I-84 Caldwell to Nampa, and a 1% sales tax skimmer to pay for the road expansion and diversion of lottery and cigarette tax revenues. When we think about having $564 million in Garvey bonds already, we're looking at nearly a billion dollars of debt that we just signed on to. So the bill does help communities outside. It, it will help Ada and, and Kenyon counties, but it does not do much for the rest of our state. And we have a lot of debt that we handed to our children and grandchildren. It is critical to ensure that the very foundation of our democratic process is preserved and defended. The House passed an early voting bill aimed at hamstringing counties who are trying to increase voter participation by limiting, limiting early voting by as much as a week prior to the elections. Fortunately, in the, in the Senate, we were able to kill that bill in committee. We also successfully stopped a bill to move school board elections to the general election in November. Board members elected in November are ill-prepared to make uh, district budget decisions um, that will happen early in that year. Additionally, trustee candidates are nonpartisan and to have, tend to have minimal resources to compete with attention as compared to well-funded statewide races, which they would be sharing on that ballot. Similarly, we consider that Article 5 Constitutional Convention to pass the budget balance amendment that was defeated in the Senate a victory. While we think the balanced budget merits urgent consideration, opening the U.S. Constitution to serious implications and not being able to hold it to a single issue was not supported. Additionally, calls for a drastic action should be met with a critical eye by the public, especially considering this polarized political climate that we live in. I'm happy to say that we were the Democrats instrumental in defeating that bill. One of the pro the proudest um, accomplishments this session was the passage of Senator Burgoyne's ABLE Act Bill. This bill creates a part-time position to help people with disabilities and their families to set up out-of-state ABLE accounts. Without ABLE accounts, people receiving disability benefits cannot save for critical quality of life measures, measures like wheelchair ramps, vital equipment maintenance, and dental care. This is a major quality of life improvement for people with disabilities and our families. We are happy to have been able to send it to the governor. So we are before you today as a further act of transparency and accountability. What we do and accomplish in this legislative session, sessions are the most important for Idahoans. Lives are directly impacted by the decisions made here. And we are determined to keep the working quality of life you deserve as well-funded and work world-class public education, and a thriving economy. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Okay. Melissa. One of the things you mentioned was being the moderate middle, and going into next year, after this year, where you lost legislative seats, how are you going to change your 
messaging in your relationship with your constituents, especially outside of voice feed, to make sure that you don't lose more seats in 2018. Well, I can speak uh, from my district. It's a very blended. It's probably one of the diverse districts in the state. And you have to be moderate and be able to talk to both the Republicans and your Democrats and your independents to get anything accomplished. So for me and for my caucus, I don't see us having any difficulty being able to express that in future sessions, but also to our constituents when we return home. Senator, you kind of on your own leaders in the next you voted for that. A couple of people in your caucus voted for that. But you were able to kill them the first time around when you came to it, and another name was Senate when your caucus stayed together. Was that, is there an argument internally with the Democrats on this bill, or was it just a vote of conscience kind of thing? Because you are highlighting it from the biggest points. Well, I, I, I think we did vote our conscience, and everybody lives in a different and was impacted by that bill. So they had to determine how it would affect their constituents. I do need to say, though, that we are nearly a billion dollars in debt in Garvey bonds, and that needs to be very clear, that that is not going to go away anytime soon. So having signed up with that, and rather than just being a clear, a very transparent, only Garvey bond, there were a lot of pieces to that bill that didn't need to be there. And we've opened the door for having any kind of pet project coming out of the general fund, because now we've opened it up for transportation dollars, I think there could have been a better way to do it. What we should have done is what we've done with everything else, is having um, interim committees that vet it very thoroughly, that make the recommendations, that have a long-term plan. That's what I believe we should have done. Did Brad make that decision? He made the decision he had to make. I'm just telling you that there was a lot of debt incurred by having made that decision. We, so when you talk about where the benefits were, we have major transportation issues in the Treasure Valley. And when you're making votes, you're voting on behalf of your district. And so Ada County and Canyon County are two areas that are heavily impacted. And so we deviated here on this vote. And I think that what that actually shows is that there's a breadth of ideas and there's a breadth of knowledge within our caucus. And it also shows that when push comes to shove, we vote our districts first. Um, we're not hamstrung by leadership to do what we need to do. That's a very rare occurrence. And I think that that's the beauty of being in the minority, where we're not told what to do by uh, our leadership. We're actually encouraged to do the right thing for our districts to make sure that we have the most impact. I was asked whether I was going to hold my caucus to uh, being a single vote, and that's not how we operate. We want to be able to have them represent their districts um, adequately, and so I never hold them to um, strong arm anybody to make me a vote. My district looks different. I'm not going to get a lot of that money. And a lot of rural communities and Idahoans are going to pay for the debt that we just incurred. So we are going to just spill us off of the consumer. Is there a piece of legislation that your party pushed through that you're particularly proud of this session? Yeah, there's probably four or five pieces of legislation that I think are going to make a real difference. Certainly the one I mentioned, which is civil asset forfeiture and redefining how we treat people as criminals and take their stuff from them is something that I think is a very important thing to Idahoans. The other piece is, Representative Wintrow has been leading the charge on ensuring that victims of sexual assault are treated fairly in Idaho and have a due process that is tracked and, and accountable. And so we passed that legislation as well. Yesterday we passed legislation, it just passed the Senate today, but we passed legislation to ensure that um, close to $4 million in infrastructure improvements for uh, safe routes to schools will uh, move forward. And there are a few other pieces primarily around uh, invasive species. We know that right now Idaho and the Columbia River Basin for all intents and purposes is protected from the quagga mussel. And we were the spearhead on pushing that legislation forward, and in particular, holding votes from outside of the state accountable because they represent the risk in the first place. And uh, I think those five pieces of legislation really exemplify what we're talking about in terms of being the moderate man. We're the ones willing to do the work in areas of our state, even when it's not our district, but because we know that for the entire state, this is the quality policies that we need. Now that the American Health Care Act got pulled in Congress, what are you going to be doing in the interim on aging health care? And is your messaging going to change now that Republicans say that we, we're going to have the Affordable Care Act for the foreseeable future? Well, we've walked away and forfeited $350 million of federal money for health care for our people. 
and um, Kansas just signed up to do Medicaid expansion. If they're not, if that is the reason we're not entertaining doing something with our gap population and our 10,000 veterans that are part of that group, then we need to, we will be pushing to make sure that we protect them, and there is no reason not to. We kept saying that it was going to be a change of presidency. We kept saying it's going to be, um, you know, repeal and, and replace. And now they've walked away and they're going out to tax reform. And so I think that we're just going to keep saying that this is the way we should be doing it, and, it's, and we need to be taking care of our own. And I don't think our message changes, right? Senate Democrats on three different occasions tried to push forward a way to get waivers or some type of uh, program to move forward Medicaid. Um, now there's absolutely no excuse. Can kicking, they've like run out of cans to kick and they're at the edge of an abyss and they're looking at probably eventually having to re-raise property taxes in order to pay for the catastrophic health fund and now's the time to really have a serious conversation. I think they've run out of rope. And everybody we've ever asked for the last three years outside of this body has wanted us to do it and it's always the top three. Education, economy, transportation, infrastructure, and healthcare. And so I will get, and we will keep pushing for us to pay close attention to this and do something about it. The biggest complaint I heard in this whole session, not just from the minority party, but from folks in the Republican Party, was their voice was just going to be that they weren't involved in the conversation. Do you have a strategy? Because this, is, this isn't new, I've heard this for, since I've been here. Do you have a strategy for getting your voice in that conversation? Getting your voice in that uh, you did not hear us complaining that our voice wasn't heard. We are not victims inside of this body. We are leaders inside of this body. And our opinion is that if we do not interject ourselves into the conversation, then we won't be a part of the conversation. And so our approach to this is as the minority party, we have a seat at the table. We're going to force ourselves to have a seat at the table, even if it means sitting on the majority's lap. But the fact is, the folks that are saying their voice isn't being heard are trying to basically make excuses for their poorly drafted legislation. And I would, I would agree, except that we may have different styles. Um, and the, in, the Senate, in the Senate, I do a lot of conversation behind the scenes. We do put a lot of our, our um, expertise and information into bills that come forward. And if we're not part of the table, we make sure that we have that audience. And so, um, you know, may not be um, obvious all the time, but we are part of all of that discussion. Medicaid expansion was debated on the House floor and went up for an up or down vote. And the amazing thing is, Democrats led the charge on that. So to say that well-drafted Democratic bills um, are um, not having an opportunity is not true. Now, some of our bills don't get a hearing because we can't convince people, but that doesn't mean that we're being mistreated and that doesn't mean that we're a victim in this body. It means that we've moved other stuff forward. So if I came in here and I said, we haven't done anything this year, that would be different. We had bills that stalled out and died or we didn't have the votes, but it certainly wasn't because we were being mistreated by anybody in this body. We're also here to make sure that we do a good process. And some of that doesn't happen, but that is for us to make sure that it does. If something's going to go sliding, that it's going to go in, the, in this proper sequence, it's up to us, particularly leadership, to object. And we do have that same kind of power as any other person on the floor to object and make sure that it does the right thing. Senator Stennett, do you agree with Representative Zirkelding's characterization that uh, it forced your way in to have a seat at the table? It seems like I heard otherwise from you in your debate on the transportation bill, that, that you felt that actually your caucus was not at the table. <laughs> in the case of the transportation bill, I don't think very many people were. I think there were probably two or three senators that actually were part of that discussion. It made it went through the committee, um, through the printing process and the committee process virtually without an adequate conversation. And the debate really happened on the floor. I don't think that's a good process. I did make a statement about that. But um, I, I, I was correct in saying that it did not go through the proper vetting and the process that all the other bills have. And that is a problem. And that's why I've been on the floor. It's where I had the opportunity to do that. Any other questions? Thank you. Wonderful. Do you have any desire to repeat your opening for those of us who came in late? Sure. <laughs> My desire to talk all day. <laughs> Um, are you guys, KTV here, are you guys done? Probably? Yeah, we're done. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, do you have a full copy? I just want to check it out. Did you hear me talk?
Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. 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 Ye